Hello everyone, we are behind the scenes today in our butterfly and moth collections with David. We have been finding out about butterfly feet and the fact that they taste with their feet. You might have seen our video, if you haven't, check it out. Um, but David, you've brought along some fantastic specimens today. Um, so, so let's find out a little bit more about butterflies and their unusual feet. Who first discovered that they, they taste through their feet? Well, actually, it's, it's a previously rather obscure person called Dwight Minich. This is a, a new photo I found of him. And he was an American insect physiologist who, uh, in 1922, devised the first ever experiment to see how butterflies actually taste with their feet. Uh, I think he has a Red Admiral butterfly here with an elaborate clothes peg. So these are its uh, legs. You can see, count four. There are actually two tiny ones, which we'll look at in a moment, uh, just folded up underneath its head. So what he was doing is using sugar um, solutions and moving the uh, butterfly to and fro to see when it responded. And he found out how it responded because every time it detects sugar, it's like bingo, it sticks out its tongue. <laughs> so um, that's the proboscis response, unrolls its proboscis. And he was the first person to discover that butterflies actually taste with their feet. Absolutely fantastic. What an ingenious yes. experiment as yeah. well. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Just using a clothes peg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they, they taste with their feet. They taste the, the plants before they lay eggs, don't they? So, so why is it important to taste the, the plant that they're going to lay eggs on? Well, bu well, butterfly caterpillars are very fussy very often. And many butterflies only live on one plant family, for example, or one plant species. So the, a good mother has to be very careful where she lays her eggs. And is it true that they, some butterflies actually drum with their feet when they land on their plant? It is true. Actually, I explained earlier about the butterflies that have very tiny front feet. And it turns out that these front feet are actually used, um, and this is um, a heliconius butterfly, and the, you can just see where the red arrow is that the foreleg, which is, it looks a bit blurry there, you've got the, the four main walking legs and the forelegs actually very quickly contact the surface of this passion flower, which is the host plant of the butterfly. And they drum with their feet. That's a bit mysterious. You might wonder why they drum. Well, it's actually to pick up the uh, particular chemicals that uh, they respond to in their forelegs. They have chemoreceptors for the actual secondary compounds that the plants use to defend themselves often against butterflies. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, can, you've brought some specimens. Can, yes. we have a, have, can we have a closer look? Can we, can we have a look at some of their feet maybe? I know it yes. might be tricky. You, you can see a huge array of um, beautiful butterflies here. They are stunning, absolutely um, stunning. But interesting enough, they all have different kinds of arrangements of their feet. So swallowtail butterflies, like these are, these are actually um, an array of South American tiger stripe butterflies. And they belong to lots of different butterf um, butterfly families. And these ones are actually moths. Uh, they mimic each other because some of them are poisonous. And uh, other butterflies can gain protection from this. But they have very different means of, of tasting. So, the standard butterfly, like this is a swallowtail butterfly. It hasn't got swallow tails, but it is a swallowtail butterfly. And the relatives of the uh, whites and yellows that you may see in your garden are these period butterflies. They have six walking legs. So they use their legs for walking and resting. So they have spines on their legs, which can prop them up when they're resting on, on a, a plant surface, for example. But these this is a heliconius butterfly, it's a tiger stripe one. And it actually has, you can, you can count four legs there. One, two, three, four. Now some of our specimens actually have had the legs drop off um, but in the collection. But this actually has two, four legs folded up here. And you can see it better in this one here. This is um, called Consul Fabius, this butterfly. And you can see in white its four main walking and resting legs. But there are, there are two couple of brushes. I don't know if you can see them, Alison, just folded up. Look like uh, a couple yes. of brushes. In fact, they're quite furry looking. Mm. And 
This is a male butterfly and the forelegs in male butterflies are pretty much useless. It turns out they just, they're as little brushes. <laughs> Maybe they brush their eyes with them or something occasionally. But the females, as I explained, have um, a, a, a special purpose to detect the host plant. So they have the chemo receptors for the host plant on their forelegs. So the males don't have receptors on their forelegs at all? Uh, what's interesting is you can actually see in this scanning electron micrograph uh, the difference between um, a male, um, this is the tarsus, or the, the final segment of the foreleg, it's just like a, a big brush. Whereas in the female, it's got these arrays of what's called trichoid sensili, beautiful um, sensili which detect these particular chemicals. So um, scientists have now been able to sequence the whole genes of these heliconius butterflies, and they can work out that the expressed genes are the ones in females. They can find the expressed genes for chemo reception in the females. They're almost completely lacking in males. So the males are a little bit uh, redundant, <laughs> surprisingly, <laughs> yeah, well, in, this in this respect. They don't need to lay their eggs on a particular plant, so they yeah. necessarily don't need to taste it. They're not very good fathers. It's the female that has to do all the selection. So, uh, ah. yeah. And they have differences in their antennae as well. Um, this is the male antenna, which has kind of got a, um, a rather angular shape. And this is the female. And the, the, scientists have worked out that there's just one tiny little sensor layer. There is in the a male, there, there is in the female. And these actually do taste. They taste with that one little hair. Ah, oh, so not just yeah. the feet, with their antennae as well? With but their antennae as well. Just a little. <laughs> yeah, just, just a little. So <laughs> they can actually detect, um, not on the surface of the plant, but actually in the air. They can, and males use this to detect pheromones in moths. Mm. But butterflies don't use pheromones in females, so they, they find each other visually. They're very visual animals. Yeah, yeah. I was, was going to yeah. ask what other types of senses as well as taste yeah. are important to butterflies yeah. and moths? Um, well, uh, moths have got uh, all sorts of um, arrays of, of um, sensory devices, not only to detect um, chemicals in the air, female pheromones, for example, but apparently they have some kind of sense of magnetism. Magnetism? Yeah. Uh, and so scientists have been looking for traces of magnetite, and some people have are reported in the head or in the club of the antenna possibility that there may be magnetic senses. They also have um, uh, mechanisms to detect uh, circadian rhythms. They kind of uh, they can sense day length. So there are special cells in the antenna which sense day length, for example. Why would they need to uh, detect magnetic magnet Why would they need magnetic? Well, why, why uh, it's sense? particularly important in migratory butterflies. You've probably heard of the monarch butterfly, mm. but it's been found in the bogon moth that uh, not only can they use um, cues of the Earth's magnetic fields to navigate. The bogon moth is, an, is a, like a monarch-like moth that lives in Australia, it, and it roosts in huge numbers and migrates thousands of miles in the east of Australia. And it not only has a magnetic sense, it has a star compass. And you can actually confuse a bogon moth by projecting a um, special stellarium, a kind of um, st stellarium with an app on your phone. You can project the star map and you can confuse it with a northern hemisphere star map. It turns out they can't work out their way around. With a, wow. they, they actually are imprinted with a southern hemisphere star map. That is incredible. In a tiny little moth brain. Yeah. Yeah, we've got so some... those are some other examples of senses. Yeah, I was going to say we've got yeah. some moths over here, haven't we? Just we to have. Have a quick look at these amazing specimens. What's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Everyone asks me Everyone that. Everyone asks that, yeah. <laughs> and there's no, you know, there's no simple answer. No. <laughs> um, one of the uh, quick things you can use is to these are all butterflies. You can look for a thickening at the end of the antenna. It's called the antennal club, and many have those, and those are packed with uh, sensory organs, and. Not only some butterflies have that, however, but some day-flying moths, like this Cassnid moth from South America. So it seems like butterflies are really the main types of Lepidoptera, that is, insects with scaly wings that fly by day. And they need um, a lot more sensors that help them cope with navigation by day. 
but another way you can tell them apart, because that's not a very good rule of thumb, is their resting posture. So a knight, you probably notice the butterflies rest usually with their wings over their back like that. Mm. And moths generally roost during the daytime with their wings in a kind of tent-like shape, something like that. Many different postures, but mm. rarely like this. But it turns out that some day-flying moths, like the sunset moth in Madagascar, actually do that at night. I tested it myself when I was in Madagascar. <laughs> I got some into the tent with me. And I was astonished they actually behave like butterflies. They look like butterflies and they behave like butterflies. Yeah, yeah. And they are day flying. So butterflies are kind of like the, um, the, the, the brightly dressed cousins of moths. The more complicated answer is that uh, butterflies belong to a single super, what's called a super family. Uh, a super family can have many different families inside it. And in the case of butterflies, it has six different families. Uh, in moths, there are 124 different families, roughly, which are bundled up into 42 different superfamilies. So this puts butterflies in perspective because they're a mere single superfamily. It's called Papilionoidea. Uh, the French Papilio, yeah. Papilionoidea are a single superfamily. Mm. So they're very minor in the whole scheme of things. <laughs> they just happen to be rather visual. Exactly. They're um, the ones showy we notice. things. Yeah. Yeah. But they are amazing um, at, uh, creatures. And it's been fantastic learning all about their senses today, which are far more yeah. interesting than I realised. <laughs> David, thank you so yeah. much for, for talking to us today and for sharing it's this. It's been an absolute collection. pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching. We hope that you enjoyed our film. If you did, let us know in the comments. And remember to like and subscribe to keep up with the latest videos.